All right, we are live and everyone, thanks for joining. I know we'll have folks kind of trickling in over the next minute or two here while we're getting ready to kick off. Um, we're really excited about this session. Uh, just a quick reminder that these conversations are all happening every Thursday at noon. You'll find us here talking to leading experts from across the nonprofit sector. Um, this is hosted by Pond. My name is Mitch Stein. I'm the CEO and, and co-founder at Pond. Um, we are where nonprofits go to find solutions to their biggest problems. Uh, we help connect them with everything from CRM technology, fundraising tools, consultants, you name it. Anything you need, you can find it on Ponds and get a uh, and get the best deal and save lots of time in the process. So we hope you'll visit us there. Uh, but we have much more important stuff to focus on today, which is talking about CSR in the context of nonprofit work. What does that acronym mean? What do corporate partnerships mean in 2022? And we have some incredible speakers lined up today. So get into the chat for sure. Answer your, uh, ask your questions. Uh, this is your chance to get live candid feedback from folks. Um, and without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it around for intros. If uh, everyone doesn't mind sharing just who you are, what, you, what you're working on, and a couple layers of your identity that are most important to you. Chris, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mitch. Um, yeah, nice to meet everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, appreciate uh, you all being here. So I'm Chris Bullman. I'm one of the co-founders of Brightest. Um, we make software for sort of ESG sustainability and social impact measurement. So CSR is, is very kind of near and dear to us. And a lot of the organizations that we work with are, are sort of active in the CSR space. Actually, one of the reasons why I started Brightest was my own experience helping to set up a CSR program about seven years ago now. So um, I love this topic. And I guess in terms of layers of my identity, so uh, outside of nerding out on this ecosystem of topics, um, I spend a lot of time on kind of climate work and activism generally. Uh, I am also a musician or probably would be a musician if I wasn't doing this. And uh, I guess that's pretty much it. I don't have time for anything else. So I'll pass the mic. Thanks so much, Chris. Rachel, you're gonna go next. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rachel Klausner. Um, I am the founder of Millie. We're a workplace giving and volunteering impact software. So we help companies uh, do workplace giving, engage their employees around anything impact related. Um, really excited to be here. Thank you, Mitch, for bringing us together. It's always fun to nerd out on social impact with other folks that think about this all day long. Um, and yeah, really excited to be here. Um, so layers of me. Um, I am a mother of three girls, uh, which has been a fun challenge, uh, especially growing up as a, as a, what we used to call like a tomboy, um, who like did not care about anything girly. Uh, and I have three girls that are all in that category. Um, so that's been a, a fun challenge for me. Um, and then the other weird fact about my identity is I am actually an Orthodox Jew, which is highly unusual for a woman um, in tech to be in that category. Um, so yeah, just really excited to be here. Amazing. Chris, can you go next? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Chris Hammond. I am uh, the CEO and founder of Corporate Giving Connection. Uh, we're a full service marketing and fundraising agency um, that focuses in three core areas, advising strategy and day-to-day -day execution. We work with small to mid-sized nonprofit organizations, um, but then we also work with corporations to implement their CSR programs. Um, the layers of me, uh, you know, I, I I would first say that I'm a that I'm a husband first, um, and then I think uh, second, I'm I'm an entrepreneur at, at at heart at this point. Like I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a person that loves um, social impact and 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 helping cause related. Um, efforts and and I think last I'm I'm just a guy that loves to have a good time in every sense of the every uh, of the word and I think um, anybody that would probably if if you ask them who's Chris Hammond they're like that guy is um, something so I, I I guess you would say that that's maybe fun or maybe loud or maybe obnoxious but I <laughs> like to have a good time and I like to give back anytime I can. Awesome, thanks for joining us, Chris. And last, Brittany, bring it home. Uh, Mitch and 
It's nice to meet uh, both Chris's and Rachel and uh, to be here on this uh, esteemed panel. Um, I'm Brittany Hill. I'm the CEO and founder of Accelerist, and we are a software platform that helps support nonprofit organizations and companies in building partnerships with each other and measuring their impact on the community and on bottom line. So we do, speaking of measurement, Chris, also love measurement and measure C, the S in ESG and, and support ESG reporting from there. Um, in terms of layers of me, uh, so many, right? Um, the um, first thing obviously that comes to mind, I definitely am also Rachel, like you, a mother of two. My girls are not as girly, but um, <laughs> I'm 40 and I was the opposite growing up. So I feel your, I feel your pain there, but it's so much fun. And um, uh, a mom, a wife, entrepreneur is also part of my identity for sure. And part of what we've called kind of an accelerist, this, this rise of purpose people, which I would consider all of us on the line um, being a part of. And um, I love to uh, travel and love food and love music and also like Chris Gimmon, uh, just love an experience. So um, there's a, a little bit about me. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, without further ado, we have a ton mm -hmm. to dig in on. And I know this is a really important topic to so many nonprofits, how often they're like, oh, just get some new corporate partnerships. It's a great source of funding. But what does it really mean? There's a lot implied and a lot of layers to that, and it's pretty complex. Um, to set the stage, I know we, we mentioned the acronym CSR, um, just in case any folks aren't familiar with it or, or have used the buzzword but don't know exactly what it means. Rachel, could you start off with a quick definition of CSR and why it's so important for nonprofits? Yeah, sure. Um, so CSR is corporate social responsibility. Um, there are probably a lot, probably every single one of us have, have a different definition of CSR. Um, we, we have started to use more of the uh, terminology of social impact, which is um, actually, I mean, I'm not a historian on the topic, but uh, if, you, if you look at the data um, in Europe, uh, it's much more common to use the term CSR. And actually in the US, it's much more common to use social impact now. Um, it's becoming more of like the phrase that folks use, corporate social impact. Um, but for the most part, it's just uh, companies doing their part uh, beyond, you know, their bottom line and and giving back um, to their communities in whatever uh, genres that means. So it's kind of like the S in ESG, um, although it could also be the, uh, you know, the E, um, but it's basically the E slash the S in ESG. Um, and yeah, that's that's my definition, but I'm sure everyone else has a, has a different one. Yeah, Chris, I'd love to, I know you spent a, like a lot of deep time in this space too. What does it mean to you and kind of how has it evolved as it relates to nonprofits today? Is that a Chris Bullman question or a Chris Hammond question? Oh, I'm gonna have to be way more specific. That was a Chris Bullman question and I oh, will cool. specify last names going forward. <laughs> yeah, so so I think for, for people who spend most of their time in the nonprofit space, there's a lot of different potential like, acronyms and departments and teams in the corporate world. And um, they're often overlapping. Sometimes different things mean different things at different companies. But I think if, if I try to summarize the, the general lay of the land, so there, there's a, a newer but pretty important trend in kind of corporate governance called ESG, which stands for Environmental Social Governance. So a lot of organizations, when they issue, like, for example, um, annual impact reports or annual stakeholder reports, or they comply with different laws and regulations, like maybe in Europe, the, the CSRD or the FCA's regulations in the UK, those are ESG reports. And then ESG reports are usually gathering data from different departments in a company. So there's usually a sustainability team that's supplying a lot of the environmental data. There's a CSR or a social impact team that's often supplying the social data and doing a lot of the program work that's going into the social performance. And then there's other things happening on the governance side. And then, you know, as, as Rachel was alluding to, even kind of within CSR, like there are different, I guess you could say flavors of CSR. So there can be corporate philanthropy, which is just like really focused on like corporate giving. There can be employee engagement, which might have a giving component, but might also be looking at like volunteering and community programs. And then there's more of like the classic vanilla CSR, which sometimes is doing a bunch of different things. 
So I do think it's helpful, particularly as you're navigating the corporate partner ecoship, e ecosystem rather, to kind of understand like what different departments are doing and where they fit in the overall equation and how like a CSR partnership is contributing to an organization like on a corporate side, like their overall perception of value and performance and things like that. Yeah, I think that's, Chris, it's really interesting to bring up the importance of this may sound company specific or for-profit specific, but you need to understand where these things lie and who's responsible for what to make an impact. Brittany, how have you seen that knowledge of the other side of, of the partnership be important for nonprofits that are successful with their corporate partnerships? Yeah, I think it comes back to what's your role, you know, in that CSR and ESG ecosystem. Um, I think it's for nonprofits in general has evolved beyond the beneficiary and benefactor, benefactor relationship. You know, corporate philanthropy, which is, I, I think, probably one of the earliest forms of companies being a good community citizen and giving back just because it was the right thing to do and mostly in, in kind or cash donations is obviously evolved significantly beyond that. And so I think it's been forcing a lot of nonprofit organizations that we work with and talk to um, to think about how can we not only receive funds and, and partner true build a true partnership with this company, but also what's our role in their ESG ecosystem? How can we be an expert if if it makes sense on helping them, you know, upgrade their supply chain? Or how can we be an expert in, you know, board diversity? How can we be an expert or, you know, engage to, to Chris's point, their workforce um, in mission, not just, you know, volunteerism, but how do we actually engage them and, um, and truly be a partner, a business partner, not just a philanthropic uh, beneficiary. So I, I think the evolution has gone way beyond the transactional. And a lot of folks say transformational and, and but really it's fully integrated and thinking about uh, partnerships through a different lens um, is extremely important in this environment to scale uh, these types of partnerships. Yeah. And Chris Hammond, I know it's, it, you've been running your business for almost 10 years. Like how has that conversation evolved, I guess, for a bit of a history lesson, like 10 years ago, how would this conversation been different than it is today? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think what, what's been one of the biggest differences is um, we've really seen a shift from a lot of different corporations that went from really just giving the discretionary funds. If an executive was interested in giving uh, money, it was it was a pretty easy um, operation. If you got if you got that person to buy in, they were going to give a donation. They could give a sponsorship. Um, and, it, and it was really a, a, a just getting to the right person. Um, but now um, we've really seen a lot of these corporations become um, much more uh, sophisticated and getting to a point where we're seeing more a rise of corporate foundations um, and really making it so it's no longer just uh, a DEI, one DEI staff member that is the person that's approving um, these, these discretionary funds. You're now seeing a full-fledged process. And um, as Brittany mentioned, it's now something where a lot of these corporations or these corporate foundations really are looking for what's in it for me, right? I, I, I don't want this just to be something where I'm um, being transactional and writing a check. I want to find out, are, is there going to be an opportunity for employee engagement? Is there going to be an opportunity for um, co-branded marketing? But also, you need to really make sure that you're um, going through all of our different guidelines and it needs to be something that if you don't fit our guidelines, that this won't be a partnership. So I've really seen uh, it change, and I, I I think it's changed for the better uh, because before it really was something that was a, a top down approach uh, for CSR, where it really was whatever the executive team was interested in, and I think that they are now valuing a, a bit more of that that bottom up approach and seeing what their employees are actually interested in, um, and building guidelines and making sure that these nonprofits are um, in compliance with them. Yeah, and, and it's clear that there's such a big opportunity, as you mentioned, that the development and how companies are thinking about it. So if I'm on the nonprofit side, especially if I haven't been super engaged with corporate partnerships before, 
Rachel, what would you say to a, a maybe a newer nonprofit or smaller nonprofit that's like, okay, I want to get in on this and I, I definitely want to ramp up our corporate partnerships. What are the right first steps? Like, how would you uh, advise them to get started? Yeah, great question. Um, so I would do twofold. One, go local. Companies really want to partner with local nonprofits to where their headquarters are or where their big offices are. Um, so it's really important to think about that and size. So there's a lot of correlation between size of company and the partners they choose. And um, so think about how big you are, right? If you're a really small nonprofit, maybe trying to go for the huge enterprise company that's in your city is, is not the best option. But maybe there's a 300 person company in your city that you happen to know someone who's the engineering manager there, right? Like that is a really good place to try to get in with. Um, so think about that size of business. Think about what you're doing, right? If you're an education-oriented nonprofit, maybe going to a publisher or a local, anything that's kind of related to what you're doing because they are going to want to invest their dollars, their employee engagement in something that not all the time, but oftentimes relates to what they're doing as a business. Um, so be thoughtful about kind of industry, size, and then location, right? You really want to think locally because companies are looking for that local, right? If they're based in Phoenix, like they don't want to give to a nonprofit in Boston, right? It's just not related to what, who they are and their, you know, everything that they're about. Um, I'm sure they like love that nonprofit in Boston if they met it, but it's it just, it's not connected to them and to their employees. And so um, how would I get started? I would think about who's in my network, right? Who's in my network in, you know, that I know that if, bring a team together, right? Bring your, bring your nonprofit team together and say, okay, this is the target company that we're looking for, right? Something in this area, maybe in these three industries. Um, does anyone know at a company, know someone that works at a company that fits these things? And then try to start those relationships with those companies. I would say that's a really good kind of starting point and kind of blueprint to try to find partners um, because we see kind of those three pieces correlate. Um, and then lastly, like there are platforms, right? Like, you know, three of us kind of all work on platforms here. Um, there's technology that you can actually for free join, uh, put your name out there, build profiles, all that stuff and companies see it, right? So I can't speak for everybody else, but I'm sure everyone has a variation of this, right? Like you can go on to Millie for free, build out a profile, add videos and statistics and dollar strength and pictures and all that fun stuff totally for free. You can manage all the giving that's coming through, set up electronic payments, and you'll start to see people give because your profile will show up on all these companies that are using Millie, in our case, Millie, but in everybody else's case, the other platform. So think about kind of, uh, you know, that's an easy, like quick win, right? Go look at all the social impact platforms that are out there, create your nonprofit profiles across each one. Um, but it's not gonna, you can't just set it and then, you know, assume that you're just going to get, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not going to work like that. Um, so definitely I would do like that two pronged approach, like start with these easy, quick wins, uh, build the profiles. And then um, I would go out and be strategic around who you want to approach. Yeah. The visibility, I think is such a great point there, Rachel, that there's like easy ways to get on people's radar um, generally, and then having that intentional component we had one question in the chat. I should make sure Jeffrey knows. Yes, um, this will be available on the Pond YouTube channel immediately afterwards. So everyone, you can share it with your boss or your team because there's definitely a lot of helpful stuff. And just reiterating, anyone on the line, if you've got questions for folks, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll be sure to get to them. Um, on that point, and Chris Hammond, I love your take on if I'm a little bit past that initial, we have some corporate partners but maybe I've also had some bad experiences in the past. Like, oh yeah, they said they were gonna help us. And then we were running around doing tons of stuff. Then their checks were getting smaller and smaller or like they had a headline that wasn't really mission aligned with us. Like, what do you do when you're in more of that like assessment phase of your corporate partnerships? Um, well, you know, I, 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 think, I think one of the big things that, that I even talked about a little bit earlier was making sure that this is a two-sided partnership, right? And and really making sure that, hey, are are we giving this company that we're working with everything that they need? But really more importantly, are they giving you everything that you need? And so I think this is something that you should be um, really having something any great partnership is one that, you know, annually or 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 two times a year 
really checking in to make sure that a what was it that you guys got in the partnership to begin with why why did you build this relationship yeah maybe money was a part of it but really there should be some clear deliverables um and some some clear takeaways of, of what you guys are doing for each other um and so I, I i really do think it's something that you should have some principles that you want to both adhere to and make sure that when you're having these check-ins that everything is still aligned and if it no longer is seeming like this is a relationship that makes sense for you um then it, then it is something that you should be looking for other partners as well but i think this should be something where you're looking at this as a strategic partnership where both parties should be able to say this is what we are really looking to accomplish these are what our kpis look like this is what um from a financial perspective we want this to look like and really coming to this as a partnership um one thing i did want to talk about real quickly because i know rachel talked about it um a little bit before but to that question for a nonprofit organization that's just getting started in in the corporate sector and trying to build those corporate relationships a big thing that we do um, for our clients is uh, first a market analysis and then a corporate prospect research. And we always have felt like this is a is a, a great idea to really take some time to understand what other like minded nonprofit organizations are doing in your sector. Um, so whether it's the local organizations or the ones that are national organizations, but getting a very clear understanding of what is their mission, what are their programs. Um, but who are the corporate foundation partners that are supporting them? Um, and what we've what we've noticed if, is if we make a broad enough market analysis where we can take a look and maybe have you know twenty different organizations, whether they're local or national or statewide, um, we can get a nice idea of who are the corporate partners that are supporting these organizations. And then from there, we build out um, a corporate prospect research where we're we're able to build a research based off of companies that we know for a fact are actively supporting um, nonprofit organizations in your sector. And what we've noticed um, all too often is a lot of different times, corporations are actually supporting multiple organizations in one sector. So I think it's so important as a nonprofit to understand what is your clear value proposition and how did you differentiate from um, other organizations in in the sector, you know, for example, I always use the example of um, we'll we'll often see that a that a company is supporting uh, cancer related uh, organizations, and maybe one of them they may they might be focusing on supporting an awareness group or um, patient care, and another one is uh, focusing on policy. Well, if you're focusing on research, you have a really great opportunity to show how you're different and how their funds are are attacking. The sector in the same challenge but in a different way so really taking the time to understand how you differentiate yourself but also what is that value proposition of how you're going to help them have a more comprehensive impact on the sector yeah i think that that research is so important at either stage whether right? you're new or, or doing an evaluation that research is key Brittany, i'd love to hear from you since you see so many of these partnerships in action on your platform what are some of the best corporate partnerships, nonprofit corporate partnerships that you've seen have in common? What are some common traits that, that you typically see exhibited? Ooh, that's a good question. I am um, gonna come back to that. I just wanted to add on to Rachel and Chris's response. I, brilliant in terms of prospecting and value proposition. I would just underscore kind of tying all these threads together that the corporate partnerships and corporate building relationships as a nonprofit with corporate sector is so different. It's very different than traditional fundraising. And so I really encourage any nonprofit to think about their approach from more of a corporate and business mindset. So you do need to think of it as a business relationship. When you talk about value proposition and value, and maybe this goes into your question, Mitch, around what are the commonalities of the best laid partnerships out there? It's that they tick the box on kind of what I would call, and I'll drop it in the in the chat for you guys. We have a, a whole playbook. Uh, it's free to the public playbook series. One is called Position Like a Boss. It's a like a boss playbook, building partnerships like a boss. And we break down each area of the partnership development for the nonprofits, um, for nonprofit audiences. And so when it comes to value, we typically categorize that as 
mission and societal value. So what value can you bring to that company in terms of your impact? How is that different to Chris's point from the other educational institution that you're also competing with? for a corporate dollar, or if you're a hunger organization, how is your impact and your approach to mission different from Feeding America and No Kid Hungry and those other competitors, as Chris was mentioning? So societal value, there's financial value, right? So what kind of financial, either underwriting, can you save potentially an organization, or what is your value as a brand? Companies, first and foremost, want to align with reputable organizations that their consumers and their workforce have heard of and are interested in that resonate with them. And so you have to understand before you prospect, before you, you know, tap your network, you really have to understand what is the value that we're bringing from a brand perspective, a financial uh, uh, standpoint, obviously societal, and then constituent value. How are you going to engage those constituents? That is, I think there's a study from 20 or 21 an Oxford GlobeScan study that, that went to CSR professionals and asked them, how do you actually, uh, you know, what's the greatest importance when you're building partnerships in your CSR program? What is your priority? And constituent engagement, workforce being one, consumer being two, was the number one and two reason that they actually, uh, that is their priority for CSR. And we can, we can go on all day long of why, now companies obviously know that there is a correlation between philanthropy, purpose, workforce engagement, consumer loyalty, and so on to their bottom line. There's statistically proven correlations now that increases profitability, market share, uh, revenue growth, and so on. So now that's why they're turning to look at these partnerships in a different light. So I think the best way to kind of bring it all around um, uh, partnerships really do have a couple of common factors in, in place. And it, it first and foremost, mission alignment, right? Does it make sense for that company, uh, meaning their constituents and what they care about, the core values of the company, their ability to make a difference on a, a mission? You know, if they are a grocery chain, it makes sense that they support hunger, right? Does it make sense if KFC supports breast cancer? I don't know. Um, so mission alignment, right, is key, I think, to any partnerships to value prop, value prop and return on investment for both parties, as Chris mentioned. It has to be mutually beneficial for companies to continue to green light funds and green light effort against it, quite frankly. Um, and then three, I would say activation. Uh, we see a lot of partnerships. And again, we're underscoring the term partnership and not just a grant or not just a philanthropic relationship, but true partnership is activating all of the people internally and externally within those two entities. So nonprofits are activating their supporters around this partnership. Companies are activating their consumers, their, if they're B2B, their customers, their vendors, their workforce around this partnership to have that sort of ripple effect and halo effect that everyone talked about that it can have. Um, and all of the side effects that it can have. So I would say those three, if I were to boil it down, mission alignment, value proper ROI, however you want to look at it, and then um, activation, constituent activation. Yeah, I, I would also say if if I can, um, we we see a lot of we see a lot of corporate nonprofit partnerships through our platform as well. Um, and I think building on what Brittany said, I think really like effective or kind of transformative partnerships. Um, I think one, there's like a genuine solution focus and like some real synergies between what the nonprofit brings to the table in terms of capabilities and like the resources and reach and things that the corporation provides. And I think another thing that like we've been seeing a lot more of is like a real kind of systemic lens on problem solving, right? So like, you know, to give you a concrete example, so, you know, my friend Rebecca is at Daily Harvest, right? Daily Harvest is a, is a food company. So by nature, they should be related in sort of food driven causes. And I think like the classic model would say, we're just going to make a donation and we're going to donate a certain number of meals through a food bank and we'll kind of leave it at that. And not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think one of the things that they've done recently is said, you know, let's really try to like fix agriculture. Like let's try to fix the food system 
And so, you know, Daily Harvest has partnered with CCOF, which is like a foundation that works on like organic farming. And they're now kind of going directly to farmers and trying to help farmers change their practices, grow more organic foods. And it's kind of a win, 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 because one, it's encouraging more organic farming, which is great for consumers and for public health. Um, they're creating commercial opportunities for these farmers because these farmers end up producing higher quality things and they then they can either sell them directly to daily harvest or they can just kind of increase the value of their crops. And then there's like an overall kind of climate and ecological impact. And I think that's like a very different lens than what you would have historically seen. And, you know, we've seen similar things with kind of, um, I guess, racial equity lenses around economic development which is like rather than just like give a donation to a community, like how can I create wealth in the community so that the community can become more self-sustaining and we can actually create jobs. I think a lot of the really kind of leading partnerships are taking that like broader equity or systemic lens change and saying like, how can we team up as a nonprofit and as a corporation and really drive like a broader sense of change? Thanks, Chris. Uh, that's awesome. And I, I, we, I feel like we've kind of laid out a lot of what goes into that ideal, um, uh, that ideal partnership that we all strive for. But the reality is for so many people, it's like the corporation has the purse strings, right? And you're, you really need the money to be serving your cause. Chris, can you talk through some of the risks of corporate partnerships? Like what do you, how do you manage that power dynamic um, as, as the nonprofit that's the recipient of those funds and, and kind of retain your um retain your power like what you know the value you bring to the table as the nonprofit yeah excellent questions um so you know there there is the risk right that like a corporation will engage with you for maybe more greenwashing or more of a transactional relationship which is you know we just want to improve our corporate reputation and we're going to make these symbolic donations and we're going to engage with you in a way that kind of boosts our brand, um, but doesn't necessarily, again, to my point earlier, try to really like change anything. And I think you as a nonprofit really have to think about your values, your theory of change, and also just like don't compromise on those things short term just to sort of bring in some additional development revenue, right? You know, everyone has been in a challenging financial circumstance and you're right, some of these donations could really move the needle on potentially what you're able to do with your programs or your budgets. But I would, I would sort of fundamentally question and, you know, kind of to Chris's point earlier and some of the other comments, like really try to get to know the other person on the other side and what they're trying to achieve. Most CSR professionals are actually very wonderful, well-meaning people who like really are trying to create positive change. Like that's why they got into this role in general. Um, often they are more handicapped or maybe a little more uh, compromised or coaxed by their organization overall and like the, the power structure and decision-making structure that exists outside of CSR. But the more you kind of get to know them, their values, their intentions, as we've been talking about, the more you can kind of align your mission and your theory of change with the brand's mission and sense of purpose and what the organization's trying to accomplish. I think you can potentially weed out or spot some of those bad actors or more transactional relationships, and you can focus on finding people who take the partnership seriously, really want to invest in it and, and want to do awesome things together. Chris Hammond, I saw some vigorous nodding. I'd love to hear what you have to say on the same question. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I was just thinking about everything Chris was saying and just the sheer amount of, um, Corporations are so performative, right? Uh, like we've, we've really, we've really seen it. There, there was once a time where maybe as uh, uh, as the audience members, maybe we didn't realize how performative they actually were. But now, I, you you look at it where uh, you you have February, or after the the atrocities with George Floyd, every every company was so woke for a little bit where they were like. Oh my God, we're here to help out the black people, and we're 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 gonna do this, that, and the other. We're gonna be performative. We're gonna we're gonna build out these relationships. We're going to have diversity in our in our executive team. We're now going to have um we're we're, we're now going to have a, a whole chief diversity officer, and you 
you were seeing that left, right, and center where people were saying that this was really important to them. Um, and then two months later, it all, it, it shifted, right? Um, you, you, you didn't see anything take place. And so I, I think it's so important when I look at, at the corporate sector as not just being about um, what is the, what, what's the best media opportunity, but what's, what's the opportunity to build a lasting impact. And I, and I, and I think uh, for, for nonprofits that are building relationships with um, corporations where they are looking to uh, have make an ambitious change and they want to really shake up the sector, really look at this and, and not just look at what's the short term goals, but what's the long term goals of this partnership. Um, and, and, and as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, I think it's really important to continue to have these check ins. Right. What are those KPIs? What are those what are those? Uh, promises that were made in the beginning and making sure that you are approaching this as a, str a strategic partner, because you don't want this to be something uh, where a lot of these different companies are just using you for their, um, you know, for their positive media opportunities. This, there, there's a nice opportunity here, especially in the, in that beginning stage where these companies really do need you to uh, make themselves look legitimate, uh, really use that opportunity to have a little bit of leverage and, and really make sure that this is something, are we going to build a, a council? Are we going to build some sort of committee where we are consistently able to check in? Um, one, one company that we were uh, working with, and it was interesting, they were an association, um, but they had received funding from a, a specific corporation. It was the um, Adult Congenital Heart Association. And, you know, when they when 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 there was this racial reckoning that had taken place, um, they were able to look internally and say, hey, we're an organization that's national um, and we're currently supporting um, people that are going through a, a congenital heart disease. But we feel like our marketing is very one sided. We are speaking to one specific community. Um, and so they they actually were able to seek funding from a company where they said, we want to build a, a, a diversity uh, committee, but we also want to actually put $50,000 into actually trying to um, bring in, um, finding opportunities to speak to diverse communities, black and brown communities, and making sure that our marketing is very much focused on them so that we can provide ourselves as, as a resource for anybody that's going through um, congenital heart disease and be a resource for those communities. And, and what I liked about that is they, they were approved of the funding a year prior. They created the committee a year prior, and they took that time to really build out an infrastructure so that they could look back at this a year later and say, now we're ready. We've gotten our house in order, and we're now able to um, actually look for people in these different communities and really create something that can have a lasting impact rather than just immediately ha taking the money, trying to do something and then moving on. I think that happens all too often. And so anytime you're working with somebody, really look for what is the short term goals here, but how are we and, and how are we going to work together to really accomplish the long term goals as well? Yeah, I think a lot of that, Chris, which you brought up to counteract the power dynamics, it always helps to just have a central source of truth. Hey, we had this agreement to be like, we're looking at the same thing. So I'm not asking for anything unreasonable. You said you were going to do this, like that sort of level setting from the jump uh, makes such a huge difference to protect against those risks too. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, one thing I wanted to chat a little bit about, because you know I know Brittany mentioned corporate corporations are a different beast in, as opposed to a general funder or major donor or the general public. Um, and there's complexity in how you interact with them. What is, Rachel, how do you advise organizations in deciding, like, should I be spending my energy going after, like, this senior decision maker, this, like, executive and treat them like a major donor? Or is this the right opportunity? Can I engage their employees? Can I go straight to the staff at a more grassroots level to build awareness of our organization? How do you help people through that kind of strategy decision? Oh, Rachel, you're on mute. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, great question. Um, and I think it really will depend on companies. So companies, like you alluded to, are super complicated, right? It's it's very similar when you think about business to consumer sales versus business to business sales, right? Like the, the B2B business to business sales are so, 
there's just so many dynamics that you have to think about. There's so many decision makers going into one single decision. Um, and so, yeah, certainly you can go directly to employees, but I really do think that it depends on what you as a nonprofit are bringing to the partnership, right? So if you as a nonprofit have amazing volunteer opportunities, who you should probably approach is someone on the HR, employee engagement, culture side of a company, right? Anybody with those titles, you know, head of culture, office manager, uh, anything HR related, um, those would be the great targets. So if you have great volunteer opportunities, that's what you bring to the table, or that's like a really one of the major parts. Those are the kinds of titles I would look for when you're doing your outreach. Um, but but it depends on what else you bring to the table. If you're going to bring to the table, I don't know, maybe more brand opportunities, then you should approach marketing teams, right? So think about what you want to bring to the table in the partnership and think about who those people are at those companies. Um, so certainly you can go straight to, you know, just any employee in any department at any level, but it might not get you to the place you want to go, right? That, that may get you some donations from that employee and maybe some match dollars from their company and things like that. But if you really want to impact, uh, get that impact at scale, like across a team or across a company, um, I would certainly look for, depending on what you think your nonprofit can really bring, I would look for those different angles of folks. Um, so very tact, I usually answer these questions in a very tactical way, but basically search these titles on LinkedIn and you will find them. <laughs> yeah, and, and Brittany, how have you seen this play out for folks that are, it's, you know, maybe it's like the ground game, how you're engaging with the broader general public at a company that you really think that there's opportunity to partner with? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so if you're focused on just like raising awareness and engagement with the general population at a company, like we know company X is a great fit for us and we want to make sure that we're, we, yes, have a strategy to go to a decision maker, but it'll, we want to make sure that we have opportunities for their staff to volunteer. They need to know about us and understand why that's a good opportunity and why they want to engage with us. How do you go about building that awareness and engagement with the, the broader population at a company? Yeah, I think there are a couple ways that we've seen nonprofits be successful at this. Um, first, I think, is committee, council, or board development. So a lot of organizations, especially those that are either very localized or have localized uh, approach, we work with a lot of the top federated organizations like the Make Wishes, March of Dimes, Hearts of the World that have local chapters and affiliates, right? Some of you might be uh, tuning in today and have built councils or committees uh, that are comprised of executives um, at varying levels. They don't need it necessarily be senior executives, but getting them involved for either skills-based volunteering opportunities, so donating their talent to the organization, um, you know, lending their, their time to even just advise um, the organization on, on various areas of development and fundraising or lending their network. I think that's one way we've seen a lot of organizations kind of start the process of introducing their mission and their organization to either local or national companies is getting those individuals involved from a volunteering or individual level. Um, the other way I think that a lot of organizations are having some luck now is through employee resource groups or ERGs, if you hear that acronym a lot. Um, and essentially, if you're not familiar with ERGs, there are essentially groups of like-minded uh, people within a company that um, build resources around a given, uh, you know, either identity or, um, you know, issue or something that that group is passionate about. Um, we have a, a we work with the Susan G. Komen Foundation, and they have a um, great program, actually, that's focused on um, equitable health and health screening and breast cancer screening for um, the black community, in particular black women. And so they you know, built, have built relationships, not at the corporate level, but with ERGs um, of you know, black women to bring their resources for how to get better access to breast health, how to get better access to community screenings, how to get 
uh, better access to prevention information for their community. Um, and they did that kind of by going to the tip of the story through that ERG. Um, and then, of course, you can, you know, if the employees are hooked, um, of course, you can then uh, snowball that into hopefully a more um, integrated partnership. Yeah, those are great tactics. I think that relationship building, you know, you mentioned this, having different onboard ramps, right? So is it a junior board? Is it a, is it a local board, a national board? The, those different ways for people to get involved and having that ladder of options is really great to meet people where they are. Um, aside from those like one-to-one -one relationships, Chris, I'd love to hear, Chris Bowman, I'd love to hear a bit about how technology is changing this. I know you're um, your product is all around tracking and 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 um, tracking and measuring data and, and actual impact measurement. Um, how does that change the game for nonprofit and corporate partnerships? Yeah, so uh, I, I won't name names here in terms of this sort of existing workflow, but you know, to give you a, a good example, so I, I talked to a really large nonprofit that um, has corporate partners and then has like a lot of affiliates and agencies that they end up sort of doing program work through. So basically large corporations donate to the large nonprofit and then the large nonprofit kind of allocates funds to these different affiliates. And obviously, you know, as we've been talking about like large corporations are increasingly kind of data driven around CSR initiatives. Like they wanna gather this information so that they can use it for impact reports or ESG reporting or their website or other corporate messaging or maybe even just social media. And so the way this process was working was, um, you know, the corporation would send a spreadsheet to the big nonprofit and then the big nonprofit would send out that same spreadsheet to a bunch of little nonprofits and different people. And so you end up with all of these salaried people in this ecosystem who are basically just passing spreadsheets back and forth to each other. And, you know, if you think about how much time that takes, if you think about how much just sort of employee value is tied up in just passing documents around, um, being able to automate and digitize that process and have it work in a much more efficient manner, like we can save an impact reporting process that would take multiple people hours and hours and we can accomplish it in five minutes. And so the whole idea there is like, how do you help organizations get better data so that they can justify the spend or feel like they're getting you know an roi or a return on social impact because then in turn they want to invest more in these programs so there's a, a virtuous cycle there but also just on the nonprofit side like unlocking people's time like you shouldn't spend hours and hours or you know weeks out of a month to develop and do all this impact reporting for an organization the more you can build your own data capacity and capabilities, you know, and this is through good CRM, through tools like Brightest, through other systems, you know, we're just sort of one part of this broader tech ecosystem. But I think the more your organization can be really data fluent and tell awesome impact stories and be really transparent, just the more donors you're going to attract. Like, you know, when I was setting up a CSR program, one of the first partners we went to was Charity Water. And everyone knows Charity Water, but I think part of the reason why is because they're just so good and so transparent around their communications. Like you give them money and they tell you the wells that they're digging. And that's a level of kind of data fluency that I think a lot of nonprofits just struggle with, right? Like the capacity just isn't there. Um, but if you can think about smart or budget efficient ways to develop that capacity or, you know, go through the pawn network and figure out good partners to work with to develop it. I think it really can kind of take your your CSR capacity to the next level because you can be a solution partner and you can actually, you know, deliver the impact, but you can also deliver the metrics and reporting around it that makes more people want to work with you. Yeah, I thank you, Chris, for sharing all that. I think it may not be intuitive to think that nonprofits can actually move companies forward in the tech space, but it's really true. And I'm, I'm sure, Rachel, you saw with your recent March Madness initiative with Millie that you had nonprofits like bringing cool tech to companies to have more impact. Like, how have you seen that play out in practice, Rachel? Uh, yeah. So uh, for context, <laughs> um, I'm also a basketball nerd. Should have introed that at the beginning as well. Um, so we released a tool called Giving Madness, which allows companies to start uh, these brackets online on their phones. 
Um, and they can add 16 nonprofits into the bracket, put a whole bunch of money towards it, and then their employees actually vote the nonprofits through the bracket and they learn about them as they go. And there are these really cool profiles that the nonprofits build out. Um, and then the money gets divided proportionally. So everyone gets a piece of the pie, um, but obviously the winner will get the most um, across the board. Um, so yeah, so that's, it's really fun. It was insanely engaging. Uh, we were really nervous because I'm sure actually this is something we haven't really mentioned yet, but we, we should because it is definitely a stain on our industry, but we have really, really low engagement rates on donation match programs. Um, so I think right now the numbers are at like 7% of employees across our industry, across the U.S., um, that have the option to use match dollars, submit once or more. So, and that could be, that that doesn't even need to be a full, the full amount that they get. So in terms of utilization, we're looking at like one or 2% of total dollars that could go to charity and get matched that actually do. Um, so that is like probably the thing that keeps me up at night the most is how do we get these programs that we're helping companies start truly engaged with, right? Like not just check a box, we now match dollars, but like, how do we actually get those dollars to, to go to the charities and people to be giving? Um, so yeah, so back to giving madness. So the, now that you hear those rates, right? Super low um, rates across the industry, getting people involved in match programs. Um, these brackets, we're gonna come out with our numbers and I don't know if I have the exact number correct, but um, from my ballpark estimate uh, right now, so far, the brackets that have been run, we've seen close to a 25% engagement rate um, of employees, uh, which is really, really high, um, especially because the, these programs are usually only a week long. Um, so we're talking 7% over the course of 12 months um, and 25% just over the course of a week. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about are how do we get um, more nonprofits to be actually in front of the companies, not just like the one of the top decision makers, but across all employees. So one of the things that we measured, which is really cool, um, is dollars flowing to the nonprofits outside of the bracket during the bracket period and for like 30 to 60 days after. And so what we're seeing is that, let's say a bracket, most of the brackets were like $10,000, $20,000 in the bracket. That was from the company's money. But what we were seeing were there were five, $10,000 per, per bracket, depending on the bracket size, of employees learning about a nonprofit in the bracket and then going directly to the nonprofit page and donating to it. So just using Giving Madness, not necessarily as like a competition to be the number one seed, but even to just get in front of these people, because in that decision-making process that employees go through when they're voting, what it does is it shows you two nonprofits and you get to read about both. Um, and so what we learned is there's actually a lot of like education that happens during this gamified giving experience um, where people are actually learning about net new nonprofits that they didn't know much about or they had never given to before. Um, and so that's one of the really cool things that we're seeing is, and the nonprofits are the ones driving this, right? So obviously the companies are building them, but the profiles that actually make up these brackets are all built out by nonprofits. So from the nonprofits that have filled out profiles and and again, any nonprofits on, I welcome you to come on to Millie and fill out a profile, it's totally free, it's super easy. Um, and yeah, it's great, it's super cool to see. Um, but again, I think we should mention because it is something that our, like in general, the CSR tech space should take on as a challenge. And I'm super embarrassed by it. It was one of the reasons I wanted to go into it is just that really low engagement rate because imagine the impact if we can increase it, even just like triple it or quadruple it. Like it just could, and we're not talking about 100% engagement, even just 25% engagement, 30% engagement, right? Like let's get more people involved in these activities so more money can flow because there, there's so much money on the table just untapped. Yeah, Rachel, thanks for that. That's a really good practical example of ways that organizations can lead their corporate partners. We've talked a lot about value you bring to the table. One of them can be introduce those opportunities to increase employee engagement in social impact because we know that's a priority for everyone. 
and that nonprofits can be real tech leaders in this space by being fluent and up to date on all these opportunities that we've talked about. I know we're running short on time. Uh, this absolutely flew by. So I would love just in the last five minutes we have to just do a bit of around the horn of where is this going? Like, what is your biggest hope um, in the next, say, if we had this conversation five years from now, what do you hope we're talking about? What do you hope changes? And what do you, what do you see on the horizon? Brittany, would you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so I, I think where it's going is CSR is here. It's here to stay and it's on the rise. Corporate philanthropy, corporate giving is outpacing individual giving five to one right now in terms of growth rate. And so if you are a nonprofit and you're just considering starting a, a partnership uh, program or corporate philanthropy program um, or accelerating it, I think that's a good idea. Um, I think every nonprofit should have some sort of program. Um, understanding and staffing against that accordingly bandwidth for nonprofits is always short so knowing that you do need to support these types of partnerships i think is is something to keep in mind leverage technology it's a it's all of us are in the kind of uh you know tech and advisory space and so i think this um this industry will only continue to grow in terms of social impact technology hopefully to help us all make a greater impact more efficiently and effectively so I think transactional will turn continue to turn to transformational and I encourage you all to kind of think big and innovative of how you can play a role uh, with companies and helping them make a difference in the world um, and impact you know the the world for greater good so I'll leave it there thank you Brittany Chris Hammond what do you hope we're talking about five years from now yeah, um, so I, I think it's two sided. So to to really piggyback on what Brittany was saying, I, I think I think more on on the nonprofit side, this needs to be a focus, and this shouldn't be something that is uh, one of somebody's ten roles, right? I think if you really want to have a sophisticated corporate giving program, you really need to invest in having a development person that's really dedicated on making these inroads and building these relationships. Because as we've all said together, it's, it's not particularly easy to get in these companies, but if you go through um, the work of building out these, these strategic, strategic relationships, whether it's through committees, whether it's um, really building, using your board and leaning on your board wherever you can. But I also I also always tell everybody, you know, to use LinkedIn to your best of your abilities. I know Rachel talked about that a little bit, but using those second degree connections and those first degree connections to really see if you can actually get inside of these companies. I think it's really, really important to just have the time to do the research, to really take the time to build out what are these value propositions? What are you looking to offer? What are you looking to accomplish by these relationships? And to me, a big thing that I think that nonprofits need to do, because I, I feel that so often organizations are, are giving one way to partner with them, two ways to partner with them. Really, you should have a suite of different ways that, that an organization should be able to partner and, and make it something that can be customized based off of the company that you're working with and showing that you've taken the time to do your homework and understand how you're going to be helping them. So I think just from a nonprofit perspective, this needs to be something where you're going in as a thought partner and as a strategic partner and, and really making sure that this is not something that you're reaching out with your hands out anymore. And then um, just real quickly on the corporate side, I, I really just believe that this needs to be something that um, this is not just one DEI person's job. This needs to be something where you are building out a sophisticated CSR program. And I, I always look to um, an initiative that India tried to do in 2016, where they were um, doing like a 2% rule, where if an organization, if a company was making over, I think it was over 100 million, they had to at least donate 2% of their funds back to the NGO space. I think corporations, like obviously we're not, we probably won't ever get to a point where that's being enforced. But I think that companies should really think with that sort of uh, ethos of, hey, we got to give back. If we're making you know, a, quite a bit of money. We need to give back and we need to be um, strategic about how we're giving back and not just have it be something short term for, for a PR opportunity, but really making this a, a lasting impact and continuing um, to help the community because I think corporations have the money and the power and the influence to do so. 
Awesome. Well, my prediction would be that every nonprofit is better using LinkedIn, which should surprise no one if you know me. Um, Chris, really quick, do you have a, a quick prediction for us, Chris Pullman? Yeah, um, I you know I definitely would agree that we're kind of in the midst of this like broader cultural awakening, and I think companies are under this sort of perfect storm of you know their employees want them to be better, their customers want them to be better, governments, investors, like pretty much everyone wants you to be better at this point, and you know we can call it like conscious capitalism, and you know you can question sort of the motivations or the incentives, but there's just enormous pressure on companies to change and. I'm cautiously optimistic that we are seeing sort of a more system-wide cultural and leadership awareness change around these issues that will lead to companies basically just integrating CSR and ESG into kind of their basic operating model and kind of day-to-day -day business. Like my hope almost is, is in like five years, we don't use CSR and we don't use ESG. Like we just talk about like companies doing the things that they do. And that includes like giving back to the environment and reducing their emissions and and all of these other sort of positive benefits um, in addition to their day to day operations. Awesome. Rachel, we're over time. You got a quick one for us <laughs> to finish. <laughs> we're over time. So I echo what everybody else said. <laughs> awesome. OK, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, be sure to follow all these these great speakers in the panel and be sure to give us feedback. You'll get 50 bucks in your pond account just for letting us know what you thought about this session. Um, you can use that on about 100 different categories of tools and services that nonprofits use every day by signing up for Pond for free. Thank you, everybody. Have a great one.